Hotep. Hotep. Welcome to the Mlefe Kete Asante Institute. It is my pleasure to announce our speaker for this afternoon, Dr. Nadav, a proud mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother who has lived in Ghana, Nigeria, Canada, the United States, and the UK. She graduated with a Master's of Science degree from the Institute of Education and Sociology with a focus in racism and the miseducation of the black child. She later graduated with a PhD from SUNY Buffalo with a focus on African culture, women in education, and has written articles, chapters, encyclopedia entries, and three books, African Mothers, Bearers of Culture, Makers of Social Change, The Afrocentric School, A Blueprint, and co-authored Being Human Being, Transforming the Race Discourse with Malefe Kete Asante. Her accomplishments include her involvement in developing African-centered and Afrocentric schools. Dr. Nod Dove is an assistant professor of Africology at Temple University with a focus on African culture, African women, particularly African mothers, and the Africological epistemology. Please put your hands together and show your love for Dr. Nod Dove. Thank you so much, Dr. Jabali Ade. Always an honor to be um, introduced by such a brilliant orator. Um, it's a great honor for me to be invited here at the Maleficati Asante Institute to speak on my book, The Afrocentric School. Um, the, the Afrocentric School, I'll talk a little bit about the background and what it means. Um, as it says, it's an educational book, and it's geared for um, children, African children, whose ages range from three years to 15 years. And it's really a combination of my experiences as a mother, uh, grandmother and great-grandmother, and also in life experiencing going to racist schools in the UK and experiencing being loved in Africa and seeing my parents the way they were treated. So it's really a lifelong sort of ex background of knowledge that has been uh, fundamental to the development of this book. So I hope you'll bear with me and if you have questions or that you would like to ask me uh, towards the end, I'll be very, very happy be because I find that I'm more able to answer questions than I am able to sometimes put my points across, so bear with me. When I say I'm breaking the boundaries of race and patriarchy, I'm really taking an Afrocentric, Africological perspective um, to speak about race and patriarchy as cultural constructs. And um, this has come to, has a, a, a significant reality on the lives of people of African descent, particularly the darkest skinned uh, children. And so my focus really is on, on that, uh, on on understanding race, that has been my training, and that is why I'm now able to um, unpick it, dismantle it, and understand what it truly is. Um, so it, uh, I've just put together some of these uh, symbols which really mean uh, knowledge and education uh, from ancient Egypt, Kemet, if you like, um, because it is to give that kind of understanding that the book itself um, is one that uh, focuses very much on the classical African understanding of humanity. So uh, that, that's a kind of central theme that runs through the book. So I'm just providing images to understand the significance of what the book is about, its focus on ancient Africa and um, the understanding of Afrocentric theory or Africology, which is the ability and 
to be able to research and study and investigate and interrogate everything that is African. Um, the cultural foundation of the school. When we talk about education, it simply is a matter of culture and the battle for the mind, which is where we are today. Um, so we should make no bones about that and just deal with the reality of the situation that we're living in. Afrocentric theory itself underlines the discipline of Africology, which I am an Africologist. It's an academic discipline created by Dr. Malefi Katie Asante to retrieve the minds of African people everywhere in the world. It is specifically a non-racist academic pursuit, unlike all other disciplines. One can gain a bachelor, master's or doctoral degree and doctoral degree and use these levels of knowledge as accreditation, um, which is very much like uh, the classical African pursuit of education where you would have levels of learning and attainment <coughs> and achievement in education. Um, the discipline is developing in the tradition of ancient African academic disciplines from classical Africa and what is very, very critical and important to understand about this discipline is, is that it's based on truth. And this is education, to have knowledge of truth. Um, institutions of education and others. Um, here I'm focusing on the minds because the mind is a critical part of existence. It shapes culture and culture shapes the mind. And one uses the mind to understand reality or what is going on in the world. The major institutions that impact the development of the mind, body and soul, because they're actually not separate, they all come together, as we understand in ancient Africa. The family, education, spiritual systems, uh, ways in which one conducts a relationship to the source of life, health care, which is the looking after of the mind, body and soul, politics, the ideas that help us organize socially in the best interest of societies, uh, and entertainment, human acts, creative artistic skills, music, sculptures, events, rituals, that can bring us together to enjoy and appreciate economic and financial affairs. And the reason that I'm mentioning these institutions is that all societies have them, no matter how small or large. And they are all influenced and shaped by culture. Um, and in looking at education, we look at the construction of what is called academia, all institutions are material reflections of the cultures that formed them. <clears throat> this book attempts, like Africology, to recapture and reconnect the African mind to its former African cultural institutional beliefs and values. <clears throat> the theoretical constructs of evolution and progress that we have all been trained in place Africa on the margins of civilization and imply that before Indo-Aryans, Europeans, Southwest Asian people, Africa had accomplished nothing. And some of our uh, European great uh, philosophers like Hegel, for instance, who we're all familiar with, uh, aspires to believing that and teaching the world that that is true and he is considered to be a great person. Um, we're considered to be before these um, cultures, we're considered to be monkeys, coming from monkeys. This belief is the foundation of all disciplines, not Africology of course, but within the Pan-European Academy because these disciplines are either built upon the wealth of African people and the uh, amounts of 
uh, finance is accumulated by the enslavement and colonization of African people and also their theories are all grounded in the demonization and debasement of African humanity. And it is Africology that does not come from this perspective. And that is why it's always endangered and that there are always people who are antithetical to Africology, to the discipline, to those who have um, spent their lives, like Dr. Asante, who's created the actual discipline. Um, and so it's uh, a much maligned discipline in of itself. Um, so uh, I go back to the root of this discipline of Africology. Africa is the origin of civilization and culture. The first people, Homo sapiens, that's us, are African. Our ancestors are black and we existed 300 to 350,000 years ago, traveling, migrating out of Africa some 70,000 years ago. I'm mentioning this because this is the root of the actual book, and I think it's important for you to understand where the book is coming from, the theory and ideas that it's grounded in, so that you don't just look at the curriculum in the book, but you understand uh, why that curricula exists in that way. The first culture was African. African women and men created life and the first culture, which was African matriarchy. African matriarchy was based on female-male reciprocity and equality. And out of that recipro reciprocal relationship arose the principles of Ma'at. We left Africa practicing Africa ma African matriarchy, and which stands for justice, honesty, truth, reciprocity, harmony, balance, and true democracy that we talk about without understanding its roots so far back. And um, she is the symbol of the oldest set of moral principles in the world, and is was practiced Africa wide. Um, here I again, this is the underpinning of the book, patriarchy and race are cultural constructs based on religious and scientific falsehoods. Anti African black creation stories and pseudosciences reveal the African woman, mother of humanity, Eve, Hawa, Kali um, is not morally inferior to any gender of any color. That is the reality. Uh, the African man, we can look at Kush, the father of African humanity, is not inferior to any gender of any color. These are truths. The race paradigm is color-coded, is a color-coded hierarchy based on the melanin content of the skin and people are judged by the melanin content of their skin, how light or dark you are. Just briefly, at the top of this hierarchy, the white man and woman next to the yellow man and woman next to the red man and woman, the brown man and woman, and then the black man and woman. All women are considered lower than the man except for the white woman who is superior to all other men and women. So when we get into ideas of uh, patriarchy and feminism, we have to be able to unpack what this actually means in order to stand with the truth of what is going on. Uh, we practice these falsehoods today and we live and die by them. The greatest differences among humanity are culture, that is the truth. Culture shapes and informs the mind, I go back to that, and therefore, our behaviors and possible futures. Um, this book is an educational journey. Um, as a, again, I reiterate male female reciprocity. In this picture is the Hall of Justice, and it symbolizes male female reciprocity because Ani and Tutu have their hearts, as you can see being weighed against Ma'at's feather of truth. 
And this is very important because um, this is the earliest justice system that we uh, have knowledge of that has been symbolized. And here we have uh, our mut who eats uh, the soul of those who who have not led good lives. So the your the way of real justice is based upon how you live your lives, how and then how when your body passes, where your spirit goes. So this is the oldest symbolism that we understand: the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth. So it doesn't matter who you are, how you look, how tall or short wide or slim it has no relevance to being having your heart weighed against the feather of truth it is just about have you produced goodness in this world and because we have my art we know the principles that can enable us to understand what goodness is about and how to become a human um so th as I've said, African Culturally Oriented Educational Foundation, this is the foundation of the book. The educator, it, it looks at the educator who will teach the children, it appeals to the educator. The reader, who may be a parent, guardian, or interested person. The administrator, who wishes to develop Afrocentric Afro schools. And there are many people who have been speaking to me about this wish since they've read the book and seen that they can do this. And it's not that it hasn't been done before because it's been going on really since the 70s and probably throughout the whole of as long as African people have been on the planet. But um, this is where it is now that there are new young people I was around during the time when these schools were becoming fashionable, but there are young people who wish <coughs> across the world to develop these schools, and the book has a section in it based on uh, past accomplishments in developing these schools, so it has advice in there if you want to develop these schools. But actually anyone can read this book, the student, can read it and learn from the actual curriculum. The scholar can find new theories, approaches, and practices for study. So it's not really limited. Many parents and educators, as I've suggested or implied, have been aware of the miseducation of children of African descent, and all children for that matter. And we must include all children because um, we are all um, really vulnerable to the lies that have been imposed upon us and it affects all of us in different ways, yes. But true education is about revealing the truth so that all people have choices and the ability to change once they understand the actual structure that's in place to stop them from learning and understanding a true education. Uh, in with this book is an example of a comprehensive book that includes the teaching of teachers. Teachers, it has a plausible foundational curriculum um, that can be used immediately. So if you buy the book now, you can use it immediately. Um, the development of children from it, it appeals to it, it has information on the development of children from pre-birth to 15 years because of the nature of the study that underpins knowledge about um, how children think and behave uh, when they're, s they're still uh, have not been born. Uh, this research was done in West Africa and enabled uh, parents, mothers in particular, to be able to talk about their experiences with their children and uh, experiences before their children were born. Um, we often in, in the West think that our children 
we're not linked to our children sometimes and they, they don't hear and feel the things that w we see and hear and feel. And sometimes we think they have to be a certain age be before they learn anything, you know, so they have to go to school at a particular time when it's thought this is when they're learning, but they're learning before they're born. And even if we go into the spiritual realm of ancestors and pre-birth, you know, we know that people, that our ancestors have been rooted in bodies have passed on into the spirit form and then may return. So there is a, a level of knowledge that children bring with them. And if you are, if one is cognizant of that or aware of that, then one can treat children differently when they are born um, than the books say, you know, they'll be doing this at this time and they don't know this or they don't know that. Um, there's so much they know that um, it's almost one feels guilty being a parent because, you know, we're really many times teaching them how to be stupid. Um, using Afrocentric principles to create knowledge that can help children know who they are and prepare them for the world that they live in. This is what this book is about. Um, it gives credence to teachers and parents and their hopes for their children because many of us love and, and want our children to know who they are, even if we don't know who we are. Uh, that is something that, that we want for our children, many of us. Um, the book contains lesson plans for age groups from three to 15 years. There's an overview before each lesson plan uh, for those years uh, regarding um, how, what expectations there are for these children based on this uh, study that I spoke about that was done in Africa, um, which was um, based on what the children, how they live their lives. They were mostly not um, uh, literate in the sense that we use in, in the West. But in terms of their understanding of the world, their environment, of the things that they needed to do, of becoming human, of uh, learning the skills of their parents, they were, you know, so ahead that it seemed really um, appropriate to use their knowledge as a foundation for the knowledge that we hope to learn. The process of learning and growing is based on an Afrocentric baseline study used to find out child upbringing practices in some communities. Um, the expectation of the children's skills development is evidence-based. Um, for instance, when we talk about education globally, um, most of it is grounded in Piaget's idea of children's cognitive development. Um, but in this study, there, um, while the knowledge and evidence was gained from over 800 par parents, Actually, it was a lot more, but we just wanted to make sure that there were no repeats and uh, that it was, you know, cho these particular parents were chosen for all the reasons that are inside the book. This data has been used to create an educational approach grounded in Afrocentric idea. Um, Sanko, for the educator, will certainly for us we are going back to cla ancient classical Africa because we must understand who we were before conquest and uh, the cultural imposition of the conquerors on our minds that make us believe in untruths about our own humanity. So we have to go to a time where thoughts and ideas were flourishing and, and ideas that we still haven't come to learn 
were in existence. Um, so we go there to know the truth of Africa and African people. That is fundamental to Afrocology. The educa Afrocentric educator is viewed as a person who's seeking to transform into the best person that she, he, they can be. That is the educator for these children uh, in this book. We're saying that one is not perfect. We're saying that one is learning and growing. And we're saying that one is an example to the children. <coughs> um, fundamental to the Afrocentric school is the belief that the construction of race is a falsehood. It's culturally constructed. We live and die based on this falsehood. So even though it's false, when we have a culture imposed on our minds that tries to make us believe something is real in institutionally, um, we can certainly fall victim to that. And <coughs> it can be made real by the practice of it. And certainly we know that um, the darkest skinned person is the most vulnerable person to this idea in terms of being safe from this falsehood. So uh, we have to take it seriously, of course, and, and we look at, the book looks at many of the um, achievements of people <coughs> who have fought against this falsehood. And uh, so it, it has a line of, of great uh, people running throughout the book to show us that even though we have been victimized, uh, we are also people that have struggled for justice. And we recognize that justice is really part of the ancient understanding, the Ma'atic understanding that we've carried for centuries, for eons, uh, in our memories that need to be awoken. And this is partly what the book is trying to do, is to reawaken the memory and add to that memory. And part of that memory that we all understand, perhaps without even recognizing it or saying it, is to struggle against injustice. And here, because it's a different cultural structure, Justice is, uh, is not justice. It, it's just something that happens to keep people quiet and under control. And when that is successful, there's a belief that justice has occurred. Um, that is a different cultural orientation. I want to explain that a bit further. Um, ancient... Egypt, Kemet is one of the oldest African civilizations of which there is proof. They're, of course, much older civilizations, um, and there is some proof of their existence, but this has so much information that it just cannot be denied. There is the understanding that Kemet's cultural belief system was grounded in female-male reciprocity. In fact, this is where we get our ideas from from which life and culture arose. It is from this foundation that higher learning arose, and we're still in the position of trying to find out what was the, that higher learning. We, we, can't, we get bits of it, um, but we are not um, as uh, knowledgeable as our ancestors were, and that is one of the... Um, uh, ideas that within the book that we're trying to reach that by laying actually just a foundation of knowledge that can be built upon. So um, it's not a book that has everything in there. It's a book that can provide ideas upon which to build further ideas. Um, the curriculum is guided by the seven liberal arts which came out of Africa. Um, Africology, ironically, 
uh, the discipline of Africology is in the Liberal Arts, College of Liberal Arts, and every one of the disciplines is taught very, very separately. Um, and yet, in fact, these are the keys to enlightenment, and they all overlap. You can't learn one really without the other, but this is what we do in the Pan-European Academy. We become learned in one particular aspect. It may be grammar, it may be rhetoric, it may be logic, but these are all cannot exist in truth without each other. They are the keys to enlightenment, and we still have to learn this, but the ancient Africans already knew that. Um, I'm just going to show you the djembe drummer. Um, oh, right. <laughs> and then um, I will just touch upon some of the curricula in here, and if you'd like to ask me questions, I'd be very glad. Um, do I need to push anything? No, I just hope this hasn't been broken down. Thank you very much. Um, as I said, there are lesson plans for let's say for ages eight to nine, language arts, socio-cultural studies. They learn about the ancestors and the forgetting of the ancestors. to through YouTube and so on that uh, enable you to see some of the skills of the children th throughout each one of the uh, courses that they study so you can have a uh, kinetic um, uh, <coughs> yoga which comes from from Africa and um, you can uh, learn how to practice some of the games um, that came out of Africa that have been taken into other cultures and claim to be fair games and so on. Um, I've got, uh, for instance, the game of Senate. So there are pictures of the original games and the materials that the 
that are used in the game and then there's the link to the game of chess and so if children can actually learn how to play chess through the book if they're interested and chess in Africa of course is very very uh, powerful right now um, there are uh, organizations all over Africa with young children learning how to play chess um, the, the children get to learn about the solar system, what it means, how the planets move, their relationship to us and the things that we do. Um, uh, they le can learn how to make uh, ovens through the sun. They learn what solar power is and how it can be captured and used. Um, Uh, they learn mathematics, they learn the mathematics that came out of Kemet and also how it has been developed uh, now in the, in the Arabic and Western uh, uh, societies. So uh, it, it's, they learn about thinking and the brain, they learn about the body, um, and the, you know, so it's sort of got a sort of medical aspect to it. They also learn about plants and healing. They learn about how to respect each other, how to respect the environment, what we can do with the environment, um, things like that. Uh, so, um, and they learn the 42 um, admonitions or virtues of, of my arts. There are just so many things in here that, um, you know, I think are important for us to get grounded. As I said, we have the sheroes and the heroes that have gotten through us through historical moments where we were not expected to live. Uh, so they can learn who these people are. They can learn the basics of um, of the Medu nature in here. Um, so, yeah, um, there's just so much. They learn about their ancient uh, scientists that existed long before Kemet, who understood the stars and influenced the way that Kemet was developed and so on. So I, I don't really like to think of Kemet just as one thing but to recognize it as a whole as part of the whole and that the things that went before we have to learn more and more how to respect those things and not keep them in the whole sort of idea of evolution and think that these people uh, who fed into the sciences of Kemet were primitive people who knew nothing they clearly knew what we don't know so if we look at the idea of progress, for instance, for African people, for black African people, because clearly we are all African um, in the end. But for darker skin and African people, um, it's very, very critical that we know that we are the teachers, the first civilizations and the teachers. So, sorry, thank you. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Dove. Thank you, thank you. All right, at this time, we actually have a few questions for you. Some have come in on YouTube, so I'm gonna read a couple for you. So the first question we have is from Rashid Atwater, who asks, environment is missing in the institutional slide. Should it be? Does one's environment impact their ability to learn? Why or why not? Oh, absolutely, Rashid. It is so important to n learn about the environment because the environment is inclusive of everything that lives. And we believe in this book that we are part of everything that exists, so everything that lives. And uh, we have a very non-hierarchical approach. And of course, the environment is what we make it. And then we can see that the ancient principles of uh, treating the environment uh, with respect because we respect ourselves and our lives is not being carried out. Um, 
So it's a, it is a critical part of the discipline of Africology and we should be learning this in all that we do. And some of our students in the department actually go to collect, to study and gather research that can broaden the discipline itself. So um, I think when it first started, uh, there was not a, a, a such a, an understanding um, because we were culturally European. And as we gain our knowledge and become more <clears throat> culturally African, um, we recognize daily the significance of our environment, which includes the planets and uh, the stars and so on. And that is all a part of, of this work here to try to understand our relationship to everything. Thank you, Dr. Dove. All right, we have another question that actually comes from Brazil. So they ask, we still don't have Afrocentric schools, and when we read about the experiences of Afrocentric schools in other countries, we have some doubts. We have some doubts about the school's implementation process, the existence or not of a relationship between schools and education systems. So could you comment on how these issues work in places where there are already successful experiences of Afrocentric schools? Um, well, if they're already, um, uh, are you saying that the experiences of working schools are not necessarily in Brazil? Um, they're Brazil is given as, as an example of where it would be possible to have um, Afrocentric schools, particularly uh, that would fit into areas where um, the schooling is the schooling is about the people schooling and and educating self, but these schools could fit right into areas where the uh, sort of classical European school is not present. It kind of gives a space for that to happen. Um, there's a model in this book which might be useful in that sense. Um, and it's based on the successes of schools that have already existed. I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Dove. Before I get to questions in the Institute here, we have one more online from Charlotte Parnell. They ask, Dr. Dove, do you feel parents today are politically astute enough to invest in schools of or allow for their full independence? That's always been a struggle. Um, and there are schools who are charter schools and they are not fully independent. And um, there have been some independent schools, but then not all people are able to have access to those independent schools, Afrocentric independent schools. So that's why some of them became charter schools so that they could enable more um, children to come to those schools and learn um, you know, the, the Afrocentric uh, model understand who they are and there is a, a an outstanding school here in Philadelphia that is called Imhotep and so you know it's it, of course it's a struggle I mean we've got Eurocentric Arabocentric institutions that must be obeyed or you'll die you know we're kind of living in that real environment but, that, but nonetheless, there are still people who struggle to change that environment. And the, the process of schooling is created to maintain our fear of this struggle. And the actual um, creation of these schools is a challenge. Of course, it's a challenge. But it's something that uh, we must adapt adhere to as much as we can and keep moving forward in that way. Um, it is the battle for the mind. So, you know, that is the key to our liberation. Um, you know, because if you believe in the 
cultural imposition of anti-African, anti-black, anti-women, anti-everything, anti-humanity, uh, then you will work unknowingly for those who wish to maintain it. So it, it is very difficult. Nobody's going to agree to this um, willingly. Um, so don't give up. One has to carry on. <laughs> you know, you just live for as long as you can, trying to do the best you can. And that's all you can do, but people follow after and they continue this and we're all part of that struggle and we're all part. And Charlotte, I know that you sent your children to these schools <laughs> and that you're a wonderful educator. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you know more than I do and I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dove. Questions in the Institute? We'll start right over here. Dr. Dove, thank you so very much for a well-presented presentation. Um, you mentioned that you gathered data from over 800 parents. How long did it take you to put together such research and scholarly work, you know, into this book? Right. And <clears throat> when I say that, you have to understand that I did not do this on my own. Um, it was uh, the idea of trying to maintain control over African people in rural areas. And I was enabled to work for UNICEF to be party to this, but my line manager said, where are all the Afrocentrists? You should all be here. You're all, you know, in America and places, and we need you here. So he gave me the chance to train people to create a, a training program and a way of collecting data that would actually reveal what people were actually doing and how they raised their children, mothers. And so there are things like, uh, from the data, uh, so there were maybe 35 interviewers and people, you know, I was the the person who trained them from an Afrocentric perspective. And they themselves, to start with, were like, what is this? <laughs> but then when they realized the enormity of this and they read Diop and Afrocentricity and so on, they understood that these are their families in the village who are being considered to be primitives and barbarians. And so they took a new look, and it wasn't, it was just maybe a, a week, several hours a day of, of training and going through the thing and bringing up real experiences. You know, there were people whose families were healers, and they had moved from that and thought, that's all rubbish. I just want to go to the Western Hospital and things like that, never realizing that the Western Hospital had taken the knowledge of of the people and then sort of chemicalized it and created a sort of the other thing is barbarian and this is the truth so you know we learned that the children learn about herbs and healing from you know when they're tiny they go out with their parents to learn what these things do and then there are children who are chosen to be the priests and priestesses who will become medical practitioners who are called witch doctors, for goodness sake. But these are the people that are trained in myotic principles and they learn, you know, the whole thing about healing, not just the herbal stuff, but your prayers, your reverence for life, um, your care for each other, um, all the ways that you need to be, you can't be uh, uh, training in the, this profession if you're not going to obey these rules so that you will be a cleansed uh, person that the powers can come through to do the healing, things like that. You know, try to gather data from that perspective rather than impose we're crushing all your institutions and we're imposing this. So the person 
uh, Dr. Argo was my line manager and he believed in me. He allowed me the freedom to be able to do this. He took part of, in, he took a position part in the development himself and so on. So I always met people. So I, even though I say it's this, I, I could never do this on my own. Very welcome. Yeah, so Dr. Dove, uh, you have an excellent presentation. Uh, you mentioned Piaget, and uh, Amos Wilson wrote a book, uh, Black Child Development. I was wondering, did you borrow any information I from I him? I certainly yeah. did. Okay. And, I and certainly did. And what is the difference between, as far as you know, I mean, briefly, between Piaget's theories okay. and Amos Wilson's theories? Well, and Amos Wilson's theory? Um, well, Amos Wilson, his research looked at really what the black child, the African child, is able to achieve from birth. And it was part of a whole collection of, of research that had been done long before Amos Wilson came along, but he put them, th uh, made them available through reading his book on psychology and so on so that you could see the differences. Um, I think one of the persons who was very important was Ma Mary Ainsworth, mm. because she saw um, that breastfed children um, were um, able to do things that the other children, and she compared African children with European children. It was all within the race paradigm, but nonetheless, it didn't take away from the significance because once you change race for culture, you are then able to see a more holistic picture of what's going on, you know, what these constructs really are and why they're there. Um, and culture will give you the insight to do that. So Amos Wilson's work was wonderful. And towards the end of his life, he got into the Afrocentric cultural paradigm um, but he started off in the race paradigm and he was Western trained. So it was all wrong for him because everything it said in the West was not correct. He knew this and so he challenged it by saying it can't be, you know. So he, he is a brilliant man and of course I used him. I've been mad not to, you know. Uh, thank you, Dr. Duff. Um, what is uh, really, it has blown my mind in in a way that um, when you mention, there is a slide that says about miseducation of the black children. And I look at it from um, education as a matter of the culture and a battle of mind. If you can just really say some information on that regard, would be very, uh, very helpful. So I found how miseducation created a false consciousness in term, we are, throughout our school in Sudan, for example, we've never been told that the Kemet is a foundation of the human knowledge. The Kemet is the foundation of human civilization. The knowledge of the, um, of the cosmology is based on African religion before Islam and Christianity. So I, I was just struck by that slide which says that Afrocentric school is lied, and if you can say some information on that or more related to miseducation and examples that we have, it will be very helpful. And thank you. Yeah, thank mm. you. I will try to answer that. Um, education, of course, what, what I was trying to say is culturally grounded. So, you know, one person's education will be another person's demonization, if you like. Um, the distinctions between schooling and education are in here. They were made by Dr. Mwalimu Shuja, who saw that schooling was a way of creating information about the society that you live in to maintain control. And that education was about learning who you are so that you can be the best person that you can be and you can develop skills and you know, do anything. And so 
in education that is coming from this book, Afrocentric, is grounded in the ancient <coughs> idea of education, which was based on becoming, receiving knowledge, learning who you are. And uh, the schools that we go to now are European or Arabic schools, as you pointed out. Um, I would say that to maintain this hierarchical control, they're all anti-black, anti-women, anti-everything, anti-humanity. Um, but education is based on the truth and came out of ancient Africa. And, you know, we, Dr. Asante visited a place in South Africa which has stone buildings 100,000 years old that are aligned with the planets. And this is all African, mm -hmm. but the people that own the land are Europeans, and no Africans can actually get there unless they fly in a private plane like Dr. Asante and his students. So we can go further back, but we have less and less evidence. And so, as you say, Kemet, and what's so amazing is that your ancestors and ours but much closer to you were the people that built Kemet. So, you know, it's ironical that you are going to school to learn that you are nothing and that you're the lowest in the hierarchy of, of uh, race that they have constructed there as the darkest skinned people who invented life, culture, education, all that. So. You can teach me, and I'm awaiting your knowledge. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dove. Let's please give her a round of applause again. At this time, we'll have Dr. Jabali Ade close us out. Dr. Dove, I did want to let you know that everyone on YouTube thanks you as well. Yes. One more time for Dr. Dove. And now it's up to us to spread the word and also implement, right, online and here at the Institute. Our next lecture will be Dr. Yesenia Escobar. That'll be on September 4th. For all those who want to participate in the interim, you can support through Cash App, dollar sign MKA Institute. Again, dollar sign MKA Institute. And check us out on YouTube for those who are here wondering where people are watching. They're watching on the Malefikete Asante Institute page on YouTube. And once again, we thank you so much. And one more time, rousing applause for Dr. Dove and everybody online around the world. Hotep from the Institute. Take care. All right, great job, everybody.